Welcome to the world united. Welcome to the world united. Keshav Chandra Mandal ji, he is a teacher, researcher, and author of development studies. The topic he is covering would be uh, spirituality and politics. So uh, Keshav ji has sent us a video. So I would like to play that. Keshav ji, are you with us? It's kindness to invite me as a speaker in the world's largest spiritual awakening festival named the Global Transformation Festivals 2021. I am Dr. Keshav Chandra Mandal, presently working as the headmaster of a government sponsored high school in Kolkata. I humbly beg to inform you that I have been doing research for the last 21 years on various subjects such as gender empowerment, local government, comparative politics, state development, and sustainable development goals. So far, I have published more than four dozen articles from India and abroad out of my 14 books. Seven books are available in National Library Kolkata, and four works in such publications in English language have been placed in the shelves of 46 libraries around the world, including the British Library, St. Pancras, London, University Library of Scotland, University of Melbourne Libraries, University of Toronto Roberts Library, Canada, University of London Senate House Library, University of Washington Libraries, Harvard University, Library of Congress, Washington, Duke University Libraries, Cornell University Library, and many other European and American libraries. Now, after a brief introduction of myself, I would like to enter into the topic of my deliberation. Out of total 15 themes of the Global Transformation Festival 2021, I have selected the theme of spirituality and good governance and politics. And the title of my paper is Politics with Religion, Ethics, and Science, the Catalyst of Peace and Prosperity. Here, I am delighted to appraise you the fact that the present paper is the summary of a chapter with the same title of my forthcoming book entitled India at 2047 A Vision. Now, I would like to shift my focus on my paper. This discussion on the topic politics with religion, ethics, and science, the catalyst of peace and prosper, pro, prosperity, is very vital in contemporary India because politics is regarded as the master science by the ancient political philosophers. B. Jowett, in his famous book, The Politics of Aristotle, 1885, wrote that since the dawn of our civilization, we are living under political system. Aristotle, the father of political science, asserted that true. The political instinct is implanted in all men by nature. The political instinct is natural. His famous statement is, man is by nature a political animal. In the Nicomachean ethics, Aristotle describes his subject matter as political science, which he characterizes as the most authoritative science. Now we'll discuss what is politics and what are the aims of politics. What is politics? The word political is derived from the Greek word politikos, which is pertaining to the police, meaning a city state. Ancient Greek society was divided into a collection of independent city states, each of which possessed its own system of government. The largest and most influential of these city states was Athens often portrayed as the cradle of democratic government. In this light, politics can be understood to refer to the affairs of the police. In effect, what concerns the police? The modern form of these definition is therefore what concerns the state is politics. In India, almost all the Arab citizens, irrespective of their education level, place of birth and gender, are well aware of politics and its activities. It has touched the life of every individual directly or indirectly. No one can escape from political system in India. It is so pervasive and important. There are different perceptions about politics. Let us discuss in short. Although politics is a practical science and it is concerned with the noble action of happiness of the citizens, 
still prefix is thought of as a dirty word. It conjures up images of tra trouble, disruption, and even violence on the one hand, and the deceit, manipulation, and lies on the other. There's nothing new about such associations. As long ago as 1775, Samuel Johnson dismissed politics as nothing more than a means of rising in the world. Well, in the 19th century, the U.S. historian Henry Adams summed up politics as a systematic organization of hatred. An influential U.S. political scientist, David Stone, defined politics as the authoritative allocation of values. But the modern concept of politics has also been developed, though there was a conception that politics is the action of politicians whose main functions are confined within the legislatures and the other political institutions. But in contemporary India, they are often seen as power-seeking hypocrites who conceal personal ambition behind the rhetoric of public service and ideological conviction. At present, politics is not confined within the legislative parliament, assemblies, or local government bodies. It has entered into our office, school, and even local clubs. More specifically, we can say that it has penetrated into our family's drawing room and even bedroom. Often we hear of office politics or politicking. Marxist and feminist perspective of politics are quite different from the rightist political scientists. According to Marxist scholars, politics is quite simply about oppression and subjugation. Radical feminists hold that society is patriarchal and that women are systematically subordinate, subordinated and subjected to male power. Feminists look to an end of sexual politics achieved through the construction of a non-sexist society in which people will be valued according to personal worth rather than on the basis of gender. Now we will discuss about the aims of politics. What are the aims of politics? The principal aim of politics is doing well for the citizens. Aristotle envisages that every community aims at some good. Every city is a community and therefore every city aims at some good. From the beginning of civilization, we are political. In ancient period, the aim was to get ourselves assembled, strengthened and protected from outside enemies. Another purpose was our own progress. Since the dawn of human society, we have been working through the path of politics only for the progress of civilization. The sole purpose of politics is ethical rule of one class of people over others for safeguarding the interest of its citizens, making all the development of people, keeping them happy with equitable justice, opportunity, and security. These are the ultimate goals of politics. Hence, the entire responsibility goes to the shoulders of political masters and its activists. The masters are solely responsible for the achievement of four P's. What are the four P's? Those four P's are progress, respite, peace, and pleasure of fellow countrymen. The better the quality and competency of the leaders, the better and quicker the chances for achievement of the four P's. Now, I will speak a few words on science. What is science? Unlike politics and religion, science always tests a thing first and then accepts it. Science does not accept anything instantly without experimentation, its authenticity in laboratories. Encyclopedia Britannica asserts that science can be divided into different branches based on subject of study. The physical sciences study the inorganic world and comprise the fields of astronomy, physics, chemistry, and the art sciences. of life and its processes. Social sciences like anthropology, economics, and political science study the social, economic, political, and cultural aspects of human society. According to Burton Russell, science is the attempt to discover of observation and reasoning based upon it. First, particular facts about the world, and then laws connecting facts with one another and or Fortunate cases making it possible 
to predict future occurrences. Connected with the theoretical aspects of science, there is scientific technique, which utilizes scientific knowledge to produce comforts and luxuries that were impossible or at least much more expensive in a pre-scientific era. Now, let us discuss about religion in short. What is religion? Religion is considered socially as a more complex phenomenon than science. According to Bertrand Russell, each of the great historical religions has three aspects, a church, a creed, and a core of personal morals. The relative importance of these three elements has varied greatly in different times and places. In India, the word religion is very exigent as it is prevalent everywhere. You can observe and feel it in temples, churches, mosques, gurdwars, even under a tree. It is in the heart of people and they carry it wherever they go. Religion is one of the strongest belief systems which has been flowing from ancient times through generations. Religion essentially belongs to the super senses and not to the sense plane. In this regard, Swami Vivekananda said, it is beyond all reasoning and it is not on the plane of intellect. It is a vision and inspiration they plunge into the unknown and unknowable, making the unknowable than known for it can never be known. He said this in one of his famous books, Science and Philosophy of Religion, was published in 1908 from Udvadan office, Calcutta. Shomi Vivekananda further wrote in one of his books, published in 1908. Yes, that book, in that book, where he asserted, religion does not live in bread, does not dwell in a house. Religion permeates the whole of man's life and only the present, but the past, present and future. It is therefore the eternal relation between the eternal soul and eternal God. But my idea of religion is very simple. To me, it is a belief system of each individual. There are two types of belief. One is good and the other is bad. When we believe in and perform according to standard and scriptural dates for attaining personal, familial and public wellness, peace, happiness and prosperity without harming others' interests and which have been coming down to us from ancient times is called as good belief, that is good religion. And the opposite is called bad belief or bad religion. Thus we find that ethics is related with religion. So what is ethics we have to learn? Let us learn it in short. The word ethics and morality are interconnected. And these two words were evolved from Greek and Latin words respectively. Ethics is basically moral principles that govern a person's behavior or the conducting of an activity. Martin Russell asserted that the study of ethics traditionally consists of two parts, one concerned with moral rules and the other with what is good on, the, on its own account, rules of conduct, many of which have a ritual origin. All those things play a great part on the lips of savages and primitive peoples. Thus, ethics consists of two things. First, ethics refers to a well-founded standards of right and wrong that prescribe what humans ought to do, usually in terms of rights, obligations, beliefs to society, fairness, or specific virtues. Ethics, for example, refers to those standards that impose the reasonable obligations to refrain from rape, stealing, murder, assault, slander, and fraud. Hence, it is necessary to constantly examine one's standards to ensure that they are reasonable and well-founded. Now, it is necessary to synthesize politics with religion, science, and ethics. Politics being the principal subject and the most important determinant of progress, peace, and development, it must be given top priority for study. Majority of our political activists and priests are virtuous, and the few who have not yet achieved ethical values need to be religious in mind as well as scientifically wise. Through the process of continuous practice and following the deepest values of traditional India, one can easily become virtuous and ethical in no time. The ethical values 
for all those people, including students and particularly the activists and priests of politics and heads of states are most cabalistic in contemporary India. It is a fact that despite having ethical and spiritual base in the majority of our uh, poly, uh, policy makers, priests, administrators, business people, and others. Some of our politically influential persons or religious preachers and priests are behaving like religious fundamentalists or nincompos. Maybe they were deprived of spiritual and ethical knowledge in their school or boyhood days, or with attained or their attained knowledge has been overcast with the cloud of opaqueness and frivolity. That is why the infusion of ethics and values to all people and primarily to those who are heading and leading our people either through politics or religion or science is indispensable. In the second decade of the 21st century, still there are millions of young people and old people who are who have never attended any schools anywhere in, any, in India. Thus, deprived of, from, deprived of the light of education, though at present, primary education has been accomplished nearly 100%, but the dropout rate is in secondary level is, is, a, is, a, is a great challenge to India. Ignorance of a large section of people is engulfing Indian society. A section of people working with politics administration and religion are taking the advantage of a lowly educated orthodox and to some extent mentally retarded people so superstition is still eating our energy and potentiality hence all the political activists administrators and priests are required to be scientifically strong and having sound ethical values they should be religious too. Again, I emphasize that by the term religious, I do not mean the worshippers of idols merely. Rather, I am advocating for the diligent, spiritual, ethical, and honest people similar to Swami Vivekananda's Karma Yogis. Religion does not in any way confine to worshipping an idol in the temple or home. Rather, it is the perfection of performing one's duty towards one's family, society, institution, and the country as a whole. When people will be equipped with scientific knowledge and based on eternal Indian values and ethics, India as a whole will be the Vishwa Guru in real sense. And I wish the day is not far away. With our combined efforts, we will overcome all our existing challenges and become a superpower by 2047. Thank you. Thank you very much for leading your ears and bearing me for such a long time. Once again, thank you. Namaste. Namaskar uh, to everyone. Uh, this is really a great opportunity for me uh, to be a part of this uh, Global Transformation Festival and particularly to Dr. Yogandhar, who has given me this opportunity. And thank you very much for uh, uh, for, uh, for being connected with uh, so many great speakers and the great minds of uh, this country, including you. Uh, and uh, I have been listening since evening, and it is uh, really, I, 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 I acknowledge that uh, yeah, I have been able to increase my level of knowledge and uh, consciousness, and uh, I will try to put some inputs which I have learned in my forthcoming book. Uh, that is a vision of India uh, for 2047. So uh, it was a uh, wonderful session. And uh, I am uh, uh, waiting to listen from uh, Hitesh Ji. Uh, probably uh, he will speak uh, next to me. Or uh, I don't know whether he has spoken already or not. Um, uh, with this, I will not take your valuable time because time because time here is so much constraint i would like to take uh, leave with once again with uh, thanks and uh, with my gratefulness thank you thank you very much thank you very much sir uh you wonder sir please yeah 
you are asking me anything yeah anything sir else? please present the certificate <laughs> So, you are not visible. Screen. You are not screening, sharing the screen. I did, sir. Yeah, when you did, it appears. Yes. Ah, yes. Now, sir. yes, sir. A sincere token of appreciation to the esteemed speaker, Dr. Keshav Chandra Mandal. Thank you, sir. Thank you for being a part of the Global Transformation Festival India chapter today on the day four, twentieth of. December 2021. Thank you very much, sir.